Welcome everybody to another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's Medical Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Todorovic. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Matthew Barton. How are you, Matty? Great to be here, Michael. Wow, wonderful. Not unpleasant? Not as yet. Okay. Not painful? No. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Well, we'll see what I can do. I feel like you're hinting something here. Yes, hinting the episode. Today, we are talking about... Something very important for anyone who uh, is alive. <laughs> you're probably right. Anyone who is aspiring to be a clinician or is currently a clinician, or even somebody who's just walking down the street and happened to have a little tiny pebble in their shoe. Because today we need to understand the difference between two really important concepts that is the difference between nociception and pain which a lot of people sort of use interchangeably and, and uh, will say nociception when they mean pain and say pain when they mean nociception. And there's actually a distinction between the two. While there's a lot of overlap, they are distinct points. Right. And I think any student and any person, like you said, should understand the difference because it is really important. Okay, so when w- was this distinction really stressed upon? Is it just a recent phenomenon or has it always been around and we just haven't taken it seriously? Yeah, I think a bit of both. So it's always been around and we haven't given it too much notice because we always saw pain as just another sensory experience. Uh, And in a way it is, but what we identified more recently is that the neurons that we stimulate that ultimately result in the experience of pain are actually quite distinct from the painful experience itself. And so we started to realise, oh, pain really is a subjective... It's complex. It's just not like wires and signals. There's more to it than that. Absolutely. Whereas nociception could be a bit more just the activity of nociception. Yeah, yeah. Or of processing noxious stimuli. That's right. So let's first just let's just define the two. The definition of pain. So we can use the International Association for the Study of Pain. Uh, they tend to convene every couple of years and update their definition of pain. But it basically says that pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional exp- experience described in terms of actual or potential tissue damage. Okay. Right? So there's a lot to unpack there. So first, pain is an unpleasant. So that's the first thing. It's unpleasant. I think we can I all think agree. We, we do, yes. Right? Uh, pain is an unpleasant sensory or emotional or and emotional experience. So it's saying that pain isn't just that of sensation like the sense of smell or the sense of taste. Pain is also emotional. Pain is the effect, effective there's, – there's an effective component to pain, okay. meaning there's uh, – other things that play an important role in the way that you understand that sensory experience and emotions come into play. And we'll talk about that shortly and how that, how that works. So pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience described, so it's about the way the person describes it, described in terms of actual or potential tissue damage. So the tissue yeah, doesn't yeah. actually need to be damaged. damaged in order for you to experience pain. And the whole reason is because pain is a warning system, yeah. right? Yeah. So we experience pain saying, hey, something is or might happen that you need to be aware of because you need to do something. Right. Like touching a hot stove, you need to so put does the potential away. mean that at a conscious level that you may believe that you are injured? Yes. But you're not necessarily injured. Yeah. Have, have you noticed that like sometimes you'll put your hand under hot water, you don't realise how hot it is, and you pull your hand out, you don't know whether you're damaged or not. You sort of have to wait a little bit to see, did that burn my hand or was it just telling me that if I left it in any longer, I'm going to get burnt. Okay. But it, at the end of the day, the whole purpose of the reason why it's evolved is to keep us away from anything that might kill us okay. or harm us to the point in which it's irreparable. Because we don't want to be damaged. Obviously, mm-hmm. it costs a lot of energy to repair. Yep. And evolutionarily speaking, that's not smart because we, for most of history, didn't have enough calories to be able to have the energy to repair necessarily or we may not have had enough calories. Uh, but also it could kill us. Yeah, yeah, just the integrity of the our biological system. Yeah. So that's pain. Now, if we look at nociception, nociception is... Have you got an, a definition for that? So 
Yes, in my head I do. Okay. Uh, so nociception is the body's ability or physiological ability to detect noxious stimuli that may actually or potentially damage your tissue. Okay, I've got the definition here. Okay, also how close was I? The, yeah, fairly close. All right. Also by the same uh, body. So what was that body, body again that gave the definition for pain? The International Association for the Study of Pain. Okay, so this definition of nociception, okay, I'm not sure if this is the, the latest definition, but this the definition here is the unconscious activity induced by harmful stimuli. Say it into the microphone for us. Okay, I'm just <laughs> reading. The unconscious, unconscious activity induced by harmful stimuli applied to sensory receptors or yeah. sense receptors. Cool. I think it's basically the same as what I said. Uh, and so the major difference you first see is that nociception is physiological and pain is very much psychological. Obviously, psychology involves physiology, but nociception is objective, pain is subjective. So you can really measure one cr- quite accurately, whereas the second it's more challenging because of the person and their experiences and what makes them them. Yeah, so if you have a think about it, you have nociceptors. So you've got receptors in your body that pick up noxious stimuli. That's their job. Nociceptors pick up noxious stimuli. And these noxious stimuli could be chemical, in, chemically induced, yep. mechanically induced, or thermally induced. Right. They're the three major ways, right? And any of these things could, three things could potentially damage your tissue. So you also don't want to experience pain when it shouldn't be painful as well, right? So there needs to be various thresholds for different receptors to say, okay, uh, I can trigger off a normal touch sensation at this threshold and I'll trigger off a pain sensation at this threshold and this is going to be before actual tissue damage. So it's sort of a fine line because you can change the nociceptive receptor to fire off at a time in which it's just should just fire off a normal touch or mechanical or pressure or normal temperature. I mean, there's all there's been times in which I'm sure you've experienced where uh, warm water has made you feel pain if you've had a sunburn, right? Or normal touch has made you feel pain again, maybe if you've had a sunburn or inflammation. Yeah, just got a, a swollen. Let's say you rolled your ankle. Yeah, and it's swollen just by touching it. It normally wouldn't be painful. I reckon we're getting into a bit of some weeds here. Let's talk about – so we spoke about the fact that, just to begin with the definitions, pain is subjective. It's your interpretation, your experience of nociception uh, and, it, you know, it involves many different areas of the brain, which we'll talk about. But at the end of the day, your entire painful experience is in the brain. Nociception, on the other hand – is physiological, stimulating certain receptors that pick up noxious stimuli that that will send a signal down nociceptive fibres to your brain to tell you that there's a problem or a potential problem some noxious stimuli is, is about. That is objective. And again, it's objective because I can take your nociceptors and I know what their threshold is is and my nociceptors have the same threshold and I can stimulate your nociceptors the same way I can stimulate mine. So I can put acid on yours and acid on mine. We're going to stimulate our nociceptors. Same goes with a certain temperature, yours and mine. Same goes with a certain type of mechanical deformational force, right? Both are going to fire off those nociceptors and that is objective. You can measure that. But the subjectiveness of pain, which we're going to talk about, is different because it's shaped and moulded by somebody's experience. Right. Prior experience, anticipation of future experience, the emotional state of that person, the way the brain is wired and the way connections talk to one another and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think that what we need to do is talk about the nociceptive pathway to the brain and then how we interpret that as pain. So I think... We spoke about the nociceptive receptors. They're mechanical, they're thermal, they're chemical. There's different types. And, it, and they don't have a receptor on them. They just have free nerve endings within yeah. tissue. Yeah. But they have the ability to pick up that stimuli, the noxious stimuli, as you said, thermal, mechanical and uh, chemical. Good point. Free nerve endings are really important, um, which means they can be stimulated and triggered off. Um, once you stimulate a nociceptive uh, neuron, 
you can send a nociceptive signal down two major fibre types, so nociceptive fibres. You can have an A-delta fibre and a C-fibre. So why are they called delta? I don't know. Why is it called delta? Is it just – well, it's – I don't even know why it's called A. Okay. Well, <laughs> Let this, alone this, is, C. this is just a grading of the size of the axon itself. And right. So um, as you get smaller, um, so you could have alpha, beta, delta, mm. and then a C-fibre. Now, these can be um, governed by or – Rated by how big the axon is, yeah, and then so how the much, diameter of it, yeah, yeah, and then how much myelination is around it, mm. and by doing so, you can speed up the signal. So, certain signals like proprioception, which is bringing information from the body to the central nervous system about what muscles and joints are doing, um, that goes hand in hand with also motor responses. Mm. So, if you're wanting to, to coordinate movement, you are wanting to have the fastest firing. Neurons, yes, yes. So you can have a very smooth, coordinated movement, essentially. So they're th- thin, highly myelinated fibers. They're thick, thick, highly myelinated right. fibers. Yep. So when we look at these, no, and, and they can travel at speeds well above 100 meters a second. Okay. All right. All right. Well, let's compare that then. And then you start to go down to, as you mentioned, the A delta. Yep. So this is. Myelinated, yes. a smaller axon. But poorly myelinated, right? Yep. Yeah. And these will be travelling at about 6 to 30 metres a second. All right. So not as fast as the proprioceptive. No. Okay. Uh, and what about the C fibres? So these are considered unmyelinated, but that's not entirely right. true. They're just clustered in together within a myelination, myelinating body. Okay. okay. So they still have a myelination, but they're just grouped rather than singly uh, myelinated. So what's the importance of knowing – what's the importance of the fact that proprioceptive fibres are highly myelinated and, and nociceptive fibres are poorly myelinated? Well, that's just going to kind of tell you the the speed that these action potentials are travelling. So there is um, an assumption that – So when you say action potentials, you mean the signal that's The, the nerve signal, yeah, yeah that's okay. right. So when you look at motor signals or proprioception signals because they've got the most – biggest axons, the most myelination, that's suggesting that we need these to be travelling at the fastest speed Yeah. for whatever reason that is. I'm guessing that is because for the function that these are playing a role in, it really requires swift. Yeah, a lot of inter- reflexes, right? right? A lot of reflexes are proprioceptive um, and, uh, you know, you need to be able to consistently tra- – like so, for example, you got to – the proprioceptive fibres of the trigeminal nerve, you go to take a bite of some food, if there's something solid like a bit of lead or steel or metal or whatever in that food and you bite on it, it could damage your teeth. Yeah, that's, good. that's a good – Right? And, and if you damage your teeth, you can't chew, you can't eat, you don't get calories, you die. That's obviously the extreme. But historically, that's what would have yeah, happened, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, when you bite down, you'd stimulate a proprioceptive fibre in the tooth – it would send a super, literally the fastest signal you can think of back into the trigeminal ganglion, I mean deep into the trigeminal nuclei in the yeah, brainstem, yeah. synapse with a motor neuron that will shoot back out and tell your jaw to relax and open up. That has to be quick. And that's before you're conscious of it. Yes. So now we're talking about pain and you're saying that they're poorly myelinated. Well, there's two classes. Yeah. So you said that, that 15 to 30 metres a second for the A delta. Six to, thir- six to 30 metres a second. Sorry. And what about the C? How so fast the C fibres is about a half a metre to two metres a second. So pretty slow. Yeah. All right. Well, so in comparison to the others. Yeah. Sure. Wouldn't you think that pain fibres should be sending fast signals? Well, what is it there for? It's an alarm system yep. to tell you to, hey, be careful. Okay. So what will happen with the faster A delta? So let's say in this case you have stood on something like a bit of glass or a pin or something. Yep. You will be notified, your body, your brain will be notified pretty quickly that you've done something damaging. Mm. Okay. So there will be a response. There will be withdrawal. Hopefully it's quick enough that you don't keep damaging the tissue immediately, like the analogy that you gave or the example you gave with your tooth. Yeah. You know, you've probably responded as as quickly as you can. You probably respond proprioceptively too, right? So there would be – you'd stimulate proprioceptive fibres – I would assume as well at the same time as stimulating – Yeah, yeah, all this is happening together. So so the pain – let me step back. The nociceptive fibre 
is simply there to say, hey, there's an alarm. It doesn't need to be – you're going to be aware of it. Proprioceptively, you'll probably reflexively move away from, like you said, whether it's stepping on a stone or a sharp object or putting your hand on a stove – the pain experience that you have from stimulating the nociceptive fibers is there to say, don't do it again, move your hand away from that, let's change our behavior, right? Yeah, so that's going to get to that. So the, Sorry, a, the, the A delta is really about preventing probably further damage in the moment. Right. Okay. Because okay. it's faster. Faster and it's, Than the more, C. and it's more specific. It's going to be more uh, mechanical yeah. and probably quite severe temperature. So – you've stood on something really, really hot that's going to cause a bad burn or you've stood on something that's caused mechanical injury. Okay. Now, you've gotten yourself out of that situation in the immediate sense, right? Mm -hmm. But then the C fibres will start to come on and they're more governed by um, chemical. Yeah. Not entirely, but more so. So then you're going to have the the damage, the tissue, the tissue injury. And whenever you have tissue injury, you bring in inflammation Inflammation releases mediators. Some of the big ones for the case of nociception will be bradykinins. Yeah, let's not talk about that yet. Yep. But these are just mediators. So they're going to start to chemically activate the C fibers, which then they're just going to start to come on. Now, they're not going to be shoot, shooting stab in pain like you saw with the A deltas. They're going to be more ongoing throb in pain. Yeah. So the way I like to think about it is Nor that in if, 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 you know, you wake up in the middle of the night, go to the toilet and you stub your toe on the corner of the bed. You feel that sharp, immediate pain. Well, even before. Pain. Even before just wait, we, okay. just wait. You feel that sharp, immediate pain when you stub your toe. That's the A-delta fibre. You pull your foot away and you go, oh, that was not good. Then you hobble into bed, you lay down and your toe starts to ache. That's the C-fibre. It's yeah. the dull, aching pain. But here's the thing, and we're going to we're going to talk about it in more detail. The, no, let we'll, we'll get there well, in a second. Well, we'll stay with that for a second because I think that's good. W- with the A delta, you've now had a painful experience, and you've had a behavioural change. You you've had a withdrawal, and you're going to have avoidance. So, I know that's probably not the best example, but the outcome there would be I'm going to ensure that I don't do that again in the future. Right? Yeah. But when you activate the C fibers, which you spoke about as ongoing throbbing pain, that's going to stay there and it could stay there for hours, days, weeks. And that's going to be constantly in the background saying, oh, this is still painful. This is still painful. Mm. So this is going to keep you notified that there's potentially injury down there. Yeah. Keep an stay eye on it. it. Stay yeah. off it. Keep an eye on it. And is it worsening? Because mm. if this wasn't in the background – you wouldn't know that this potential damage that you've caused yeah. is going to fester and get if worse. If you've broken your foot, you should be keeping off your yeah. foot for a while. That's right. right. So this is the role of the C fibers is yeah. just to keep pain and you're going to keep ramping it up. Yes. More inflammation, more sensitization, we more things. More sensitization. More, oh, we did it a little bit when we spoke about the inflammatory I've mediators. Got a, I've got an important And so the, the, the pain just keeps going worse. And this is moving now to the, the, the terms that we kind of used, hyperalgesia, which just means – increase in pain with um, the more things you do with it or even things that normally didn't cause pain are now causing pain. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about just that pathway, you know, the anatomy of nociceptive pathway and then let's talk about the painful experience in, in a bit more detail. So we've spoken about the receptors. We've spoken about the difference between A delta and C fibres. We need to talk about a couple of other things. So let's now say that you've – let's use your finger as the example. You've pricked your finger on something. You've stimulated through mechanoreceptors, mechanonociceptors. You've stimulated them directly and they've sent an action potential down A-delta fibres, okay. let's say, right? Yep. Yep. This A-delta fibre, in actual fact, there's going to be three A-delta fibres – or three nociceptive fibres that will go from your fingertip to your brain to tell you that you're having a painful experience. So the first one will go from your fingertip down your arm into your spinal cord. In the spinal cord, it will synapse and speak to the second neuron, which will cross to the other side at around about the same level that it enters, 
and ascend up the opposing side of the spinal cord called the contralateral side. So ipsilateral is same side, contralateral is the opposing side. So ascends up the opposing side. And it's in a particular region of the cord that we... I'll get there. Okay. Yep. It then goes to the thalamus and, at, and the thalamus is a sorting centre deep in the brain. It's the post office and it goes, oh, this came from the hand. I'm going to throw it off to a part of the cerebral cortex that deals with sensation that is mapped to my hand. And we've got a part of our somatosensory cortex, so which is located in our parietal lobe, which basically has our whole body of sensation mapped to it. And it just throws this signal off to my ha- the area mapped to my so hand. So you know where it is. So he goes, something's happened to your hand. It's not a painful experience yet. It's simply saying something's happened to the hand through a three-neuron chain okay right so let's now go into a little bit more detail here from the finger being pricked you've directly stimulated the receptor right it's stimulated that first order the first nociceptive neuron that goes all the way into the spinal cord but this first neuron needs to speak to the second neuron in the spinal cord and cross to the other side how does it speak to the second neuron through neurotransmitters and chemicals so, Matt, what are some of the important neurotransmitters and chemicals that are used to send a nociceptive signal from one neuron to another? I think in, that, in the case of the A-delta, which is this one, right? Yes, um, yes. The most uh, common one is the glutamate. Glutamate. Uh, neu- neurotransmitter. Yeah, very excitatory neurotransmitter and also substance P, right? So, yep. they're two of the major ones. So, they then transmit that signal to the second order neuron. That crosses to the other side and it's now jumped into white matter and this is a tract, like a highway that ascends up called the spinothalamic tract. And it makes sense, it goes from the spine Just, just the with thalamus. that before we – with the glutamate, let's say glutamate because I think glutamate is more um, prominent in, in A, A delta. Um, by the, the glutamate binding to the second order neuron, that's going to cause a influx of sodium and other positive – ions into the second order neuron yeah. which like then calcium as well which then causes an action potential to begin on the second order neuron yep. and then that propagates up and for more info listen to our last full length podcast which is on action potentials and greater potentials yep. so that ascends up what's called the spinothalamic tract uh, and this spinothalamic tract is going up 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 till it gets to the thalamus which like i said sorts the information out sends it off to the second order neuron again through substance P and glutamate and then throws it off to the cortex, right? All right. Now – Can I add a couple of points? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, One thing I'll say, as it's going through the brainstem, most of it will continue onto the thalamus but there will be some uh, neurons that will jump out at the brainstem level um, and that gives – a activation, a small degree activation of the reticular formation. We'll get there. And we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing I'll just quickly say is depending on how many uh, tactile receptors are activated at the same time, so these are non painful activation, will determine how well it localizes to that region. Yeah, good point. So, so it's not the it's not the nociceptive signal. Not that, entirely. That yeah, that but yeah, if you, if you are purely noxious mechanical information it will it will know it's the finger yeah okay but if it has tactile information with it it will know precisely where it is yeah that's great so this is an a delta fiber it's gone up real quick and you go something's happened to my hand we haven't spoken about any pain yet yeah now because you've pricked that finger you've damaged the you've damaged vascularized tissue in your hand now what happens when you damage vascularized tissue mat by definition Inflammation. Inflammation. And inflammation occurs because once these cells in these areas are damaged, they spill their guts. They release a whole range of chemicals. And you started to list some before. So what are some of these chemicals? Well, one of the most immediate ones would be um, uh, histamine from mast cells. Perfect. Yep, histamine. Because they are the uh, immune cell within the tissue, connective tissue, that is waiting for an invader or an injury to occur. So that is one of the first things that will start the inflammatory response. Yep. But once you get this process rolling, then once the immune cells and so forth are, are further activated, then you start to get things like prostaglandins yep. that comes about, bradykinins, yep. but also just cells releasing their – if you've killed the cell, mm. so by 
pricking pricking your finger, there's going to be cells that are dyed. Yes. And within the cells, they're going to release their contents. Yeah. So cells are made up of a lot of potassium. Yes, great. And also ATP. Yep. And by that just being spilt out into tissue, that would elicit um, pain as well. Perfect. So you've got… So if I was just to inject your finger mm. with just ATP oh yeah, or potassium, be it becomes painful. Yeah. So what you're saying is that now due to the actual tissue damage, you've got the release of chemicals like bradykinins, histamines, prostaglandins, potassium, ATP, even hydrogen ions, yeah. right? So and what all of these do is they can stimulate nociceptors or, or and – they can change the threshold so it's easier for the nociceptor to fire off. Right. Great. All right. Now what we're doing in this process is we're continually stimulating the A delta but also stimulating the C fibres. Yeah, right. and I'd imagine here, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'd imagine here this is much more bringing on the C fibres because they're more chemically induced. Exactly. Yep, exactly. So now you've got the C fibre going through the exact same pathway – Right? So into the spinal cord, synapses with the second order neuron, releasing these substance P and glutamate, cross, decussating to the other side, ascending up to the thalamus, synapsing with the third order neuron and going up to the cerebral cortex to tell you, hey, something's happening at the hand. But the C fiber is also throwing off a whole bunch of collateral fibers, isn't it? Yeah, both at the spinal cord level yep. but also as it's going through the brainstem. Yes. And so both the A-delta and the C-fibers shoot off all these signals to discrete areas of the brain and now it's going to start to talk to areas of the brain that are involved in your experience of pain. Mm. So far we've just spoken about something's happened to the hand. Now let's talk about the experience of pain. So some areas that it speaks to. You spoke about sending signals to what's called the reticular formation. So if you look at the brainstem, which is made up of the midbrain pons and the medulla, you've got a group of neurons that are sort of like scattered in columns all the way down the brainstem. And these are called, this is called the reticular formation. Plays a huge role in many different things, but one really important thing it plays a role in is sleep wake cycles and also circadian rhythm. And so when you stimulate that C fiber, and I, th- I think part of that is just by arousing the central nervous system. Yeah. So it just kind of tells your brain, hey, wake up. That's right. Like it and shakes so, it. So this is, this is why when you stub your toe in the middle of the night and you're like, oh, that hurt, and you lay down and you've got that dull aching pain, it's hard to go back to sleep because the C fiber is speaking to the reticular formation saying, hey, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake because you're in pain. You need to protect yourself. Something's happening, right? So that's why it is difficult to sleep after nociceptive stimuli or through experiencing pain. But that's one thing, the reticular formation. The other thing is that these fibres speak to a a deep part of the brain just below the thalamus called the hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. What's that control? Uh, It's a big endocrine function of your body but it plays an important role in autonomic nervous system, particularly sympathetic yes and then we know that's a fight and flight so that will start to cause changes in bodily uh, systems yeah so heart blood pressure things like that will start to be played around with yeah and if you measure those physiological functions in somebody who is experiencing acute pain or even chronic pain you may find that the blood pressure is elevated the heart rate is increased the respiratory rate has changed you know, the blood vessel diameter, which is difficult to measure, has altered as well. Pupil diameter changed. And it's because the body thinks it's in a fight or flight state. I need to protect myself. So let's do all these things. And that will be an additional thing that will keep you awake as well because that's an adrenaline system. Yeah, it's really hard to fall asleep when you think that a bear is attacking you, right? It's very difficult. So that's two things that's happened so far. And both of these are part of the pain experience. It also these signals speak to uh, a part of the brain called the limbic system, specifically the amygdala. And the amygdala is important in the emotional response associated with pain. And so now you're pulling on experiences 
and pulling on what does this mean to me? What's the meaning of it? Am I happy about it? Am I sad about it? Is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? And then it starts to talk to other areas as well, like the insula, which is like a deeper part of the cortex. And that has to do with um, the, the emotional experience of pain as well. So is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? It talks to what's called the anterior cingulate cortex, which is another really important part of the brain involved in cognition and emotional processing of pain. And also the prefrontal cortex at the front of the brain, which is important for cognition and behavior. So now you're changing your behavior and the way you think about it. So now simply the prick of your finger or the stubbing of your toe, you've pulled in discrete areas of your brain involved in emotional processing, fight or flight, sleep, wake, uh, uh, um, cognition, behavior, Mm -hmm. and it changes everything about this experience. So what you do, what you think, how you respond, this is now pain. So pain is the affective nature. So it's basically saying it's the emotional, it's the experiential, it's the pulling in um, what has happened to me in the past in a painful experience, what may happen to me in the future. Wasn't there an example you gave once where I think there was a pain professor that spoke about this, about bushwalking or running through the bush. and Lorimer got, Mosley. And a snake yes. versus just a, a stick. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to steal a, a story from Lorimer Mosley. He is a pain researcher uh, in Australia. I Adelaide, think. I think. Yeah, Adelaide. Um, check him on YouTube. So feel free to pause and look up Lorimer Mosley. And he talks about his own experience. So he said that he went for a bushwalk one day and he's wearing shorts. And as he's walking through the bush, he experiences a scratch on his leg. And he's like, oh, branch, scratch me. Kept walking. Next minute, wakes up in hospital. What happened? It wasn't a scratch from a branch. It was a bite from a brown snake. And so this is... Lucky he woke up. Yes, very, very, very lucky. So he said it wasn't painful because he had the expectation that it was something innocuous. Insignificant. Yeah, it was just a scratch from a branch. So sure, he felt the nociceptive s- signal go up to the brain. And, oh, okay, maybe he uh, felt a bit of pain. But because there was no anticipation, no expectation, no emotional... So that would that be arguably the prefrontal playing a big role there that he's already knows what that pain... He's obviously been scratched before in his life. Yes. He knows what that means. He yes. knows it's not a threat. So therefore he overrides the significance of it exactly by higher brain centers yes exactly okay. right but he nearly died okay right now he said flash forward however long 6 months 2 years i don't know later he's going for a bushwalk he's wearing his shorts he's walk 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 he experiences a scratch he said it's the most excruciating pain he's felt in his life he dropped down to his knees held his leg and had a look and he simply got scratched by a branch this time now it's because he had the anticipation he knew what it could have meant. It became more painful. That's the affective nature of pain. This has nothing to do with nociceptors. In both situations, nociceptors were stimulated, but his painful experience, and this is such an important point, mm. your painful experience is not a reflection of the degree of stimulation of nociceptors. It's not a one-to-one relationship. So while the stimulation of nociception is objective, I can stimulate yours the same way I can stimulate mine. Your subjective experience of pain is totally different. Okay. And it's not a one-to-one nature for nociception to pain. Right. And that's huge. So as you can see, there are discrete areas of the brain that are called upon for you to experience pain. So we said there's the thalamus, there's the uh, somatosensory cortex, there's the amygdala, there's the um, uh, insula, the anterior cingulate Gyrus. And let me add a couple of points here, clinical points. Is so, that prefrontal cortex? Yeah, Probably. you did. Yeah. Um, so where you spoke about the, the C fiber pain that comes up, does a lot more um, movement outside the brainstem and goes elsewhere. Um, I, I came across numbers, something like a quarter to a tenth of the C fiber neurons actually make it to the thalamus. Right. So a lot more leave at the brainstem level. Okay. And they did some studies in animals where they actually sectioned, so they made a cut above the brainstem on animals. Yep. And they elicited a painful or a noxious uh, stimuli. Yep. 
and they actually found the animals still produced effects that were suggestive of suffering. Right. So that would suggest that it doesn't have to go right to the high end, the high, you know, the high brain centres, to still project to parts of the brainstem to cause Absolutely. that suffering experience. Yeah. And so we might think about, well, if you had chronic pain, so you had pain that you can't seem to get rid of, could you play around with this tract to stop the sensation of the signals coming? And they're, again, they've done certain um, interventions where they've done cord cordotomies where they've actually gone into the spinal cord and they've, Cut it. they've found that part of the spinothalamic tract right. which would report, let's say the finger, yeah. so they've gone into the, if it's right finger, they've gone into the left side just above where it come in and they've sectioned or cut where that's it, because it crosses to where the other it should side. travel, yep. and it might work okay for weeks, maybe a month, but then the pain will come back. And they actually found that this receptor, or I should say, there are neurons that are taken in the dorsal column, so it's a different right. region as well. So there's other silent neurons that may also be carrying information that are not normally dominant, but yeah. they're still there. I think that's uh, that's very important, and I. Uh, Something that I want to talk about and this sort of leads into chronic pain is that pain or nociception as a sensory input is very different to our other types of sensory inputs. So, you know, you got smell, you got taste, you got touch, you got sight and so forth. But you've also got nociception. When you experience smell, touch, sight, taste, you become desensitized the more you're exposed to that stimuli. For example, you come home, your significant other has cooked you dinner, you smell it and you go, oh, that smells amazing. Five minutes later, you don't smell it anymore. You've desensitized so to it. So does that mean they're rapidly adapting? Correct. Okay. They're changing. They're, the threshold is changing. The signal's changing. Same thing happens with sound. You walk into a room, a lot of noise. Or even headphones, background. right? Headphones. Initially it blasts. Or, you know, you get, get into a car. Yep. That's actually the, that's a good example. You get into the car from the last time you drove it yeah. and it sounds super loud. That's right. But you're just listening to the same level of sound that you listened before you left. Yeah. But it's the first exposure to the sound. It sounds really loud. Yes. Yeah. But the thing is nociception is different. It's the opposite. The opposite. You don't become desensitized. You become sensitized. Right. So another another example of desensitization is putting your socks on in the morning. Mm. You feel your socks on your feet for like five seconds, then you don't feel your socks for the rest of the day. But you go for a walk and in your shoe there's a tiny little pebble and you go, well, that's irritating. One kilometre later or ten minutes later, this is excruciating. So a pebble that was just a little bit annoying has now become excruciating and painful because you've become sensitized. And what sensitization means is that a range of when you stimulate the tissues and the nociceptors in that area, they release chemicals. And these chemicals include the ones that you were talking about, like the prostaglandins and the histamines and the bradykinins and substance P and potassium and hydrogen ions and ATP. They get released in that area. And what they do is they change the threshold of the neuron of the nociceptor, so it's easier to stimulate it. So now what ends up happening is that while it took a little bit of effort to send the nociceptive stimuli in the beginning, now it takes very little effort. And now you're just stimulating nociceptive fibres willy-nilly, mm. right? It's just happening all the time now. And that is sensitization, and this is the core of chronic pain. And then that can start to outweigh other sensory experiences, right? So then pain That's right. becomes a dominant experience. Yep. And things like you spoke about, music, uh, food, all this may sit in the background now yeah. because if you're so much in pain, it overrides everything. Yeah. And people might say, why does pain do that? And I think, you know, it's a bit obvious. It's because it's saying, you know, there's a pebble in my shoe and it's going, hey, you should uh, be aware there's a pebble in your shoe. Hey, Mike, there's a pebble there. Oi. Pebble, hey, idiot, get that out. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die until you get that pebble out and then the stimuli has disappeared. But here's the problem when it comes to – so this is all peripheral sensitization. This is happening in the periphery, right? But you can have sensitization happening in the spinal cord. You can have sensitization happening in the brain stem and the brain. And this is where the, the issue can come about is because – And is this where you think it may cross over from physiological – let's say pain, 
where it's beneficial in the moment mm. to now move pathological. Yes. So now it's becoming disease-like or yeah. disease-causing. Because pain is important. Yeah. We need pain. It's an alarm system to say, hey, be careful. But if you have chronic pain, it's useless. It serves no purpose, hence why we want to get rid of it. But the reason why chronic pain can come about is because if you have experienced some sort of painful stimuli over time, chronic inflammation, for example, where nociceptive fibres are continually sending signals. Here's the thing. If, if I stimulate a first-order nociceptive neuron from the tip of my finger into my spinal cord, it doesn't just release substance P and glutamate to stimulate the next neuron. It stimulates astrocytes. Mm. It stimulates other cells in the area to release more chemicals to make it easier for the second neuron to fire off. So the more pain you experience, the more pain you experience. Yeah. And that's the problem. So you can, you can basically create this little circuit in your spinal cord and brainstem where they just keep releasing these chemicals, making it very easy to send a painful stimulus or a nociceptive stimulus, even if the tissue in the periphery is no longer damaged. And that's chronic pain, mm. right? And so uh, that's why I hate the saying, no pain, no gain. It's ridiculous. If you're experiencing pain, you need to get rid of it because it can lead to chronic pain, right? And so this can happen and it's a rewiring in the spinal cord and in the brain itself. Now, again, all pain is experiential. All pain is subjective. So when you go to treat pain, particularly chronic pain, it's not just about treating the physiology. It must also be about treating the affective nature, the emotional, so the, the cognitive. The psychology. The psychology, yes. One thing we forgot to mention or maybe you were intending to come back to, when we spoke about the the different steps of nociception, mm. so we spoke about, and we can break these into four. Please correct me if there's more than four, but I've always taught four. So the first step of nociception is the changing of the stimuli into action potential. Mm-hmm. So we call that transduction yep. or transducing it, so changing yep. the the type, then we have transmission, which is transmitting the pain up into the central nervous system yep. um, to all those regions that we spoke about. And then you have step three, which is perception. So you are now perceiving it, it being a unpleasant experience yep. and you may start to do behavioural changes. But then there's the last part, which is modulating the pain, right? Yes. And so this is where your body may bring in other interventions internally to change the painful – well, let's say change the nociception. Yes. Is that right? You ever watch the footy and you see these blokes smash into each other, you know? When we say footy, we mean football. Yes. Uh, and and that's when we usually say football, we mean rugby. Rugby, rugby league, yeah. yes. So, or maybe NFL in America. Okay, let's say rugby union. You ever watch rugby union and you see these big dudes run, you know – they're running at like 30 kilometres an hour at each other, head on. They smash, crash, bang. They busted their nose. They're bleeding from the eye. Their ears are bleeding. Everything's out of whack. And they seem fine. They're like, yep, put me back on the field. But if that happened at home because they got whacked in the face by a fist or a tennis racket or whatever it may be, that would be an agony. Right. Right? Yep. What the hell's going on? Yeah. All right. So this is the what's called descending inhibition. So this is our endogenous opioid system. So this is step four? Step four. And this is modulating the nociception. That's right. Okay. Nociception. <laughs> so, so what actually happens here is a couple of things, right? And I, I think it's amazing. First thing is that at the same time that your body is trying to tell you, hey, there's pain, it's also trying to dampen that pain paradoxically and it does it a couple of different ways so the one way is that all these ascending signals that are talking to all these discrete areas of what we call the pain matrix will talk to an area called the periaqueductal gray matter so you've got deep in your brain you've got these hollowed out regions called ventricles which create our cerebral spinal fluid they're like little caves right hollowed out yep. regions of the of the brain stem and brain and you've got four you know uh, and going from one to another, there's an aqueduct yep. in the brainstem. Either side of this aqueduct, so it's what 
ponds area, midbrain ponds. Yeah, third to fourth is the cerebral aqueduct. Yeah, so you get the cerebral aqu- aqueducts connecting the two. Either side, you've got periaqueductal, meaning either side of the aqueduct, grey matter. So grey matter just tells you there's heaps of cell bodies there. So they're going to do something. So your nociceptive stimuli will speak, neurons will speak to the periaqueductal grey matter and stimulate it to send neurons down, sends a signal down descending neurons that then talk to an area called the raphe nuclei, right. which is pretty much at the bottom of your brain stem. Yep. And the raphe nuclei is filled with serotonin producing neurons. And this raphe nuclei will send a signal down these serotonin producing neurons that travel to your brain, uh, your spinal cord. And they, ser- and, they, and they go kind of down the opposite way in the, dorsal, in the dorsal column, right? Yes. So they just oppose the ones going the opposite way. That's right. Yeah, right. so they're just heading down. They go, they're they seeing the, the nociceptive signal go up and they're going, oh, I'm going to inhibit you in a second. They go down and they speak to the junction between that first and second order neuron right. and they release serotonin. But serotonin will speak to not those two nociceptive neurons but a third neuron that sits in between called an interneuron. Okay. So it's a neuron that uh, sort of is in the interlocutor between the first and second order neuron. It modulates the conversation it has. So serotonin speaks to that third neuron and stimulates it to release endogenous opioids. Okay. Endorphins, enkephalins, dynorphins. They're our endogenous opioids. And they bind to opioid receptors like mu, delta and gamma. Right. And when you bind to those, when you bind opioids to those receptors, it has a range of effects. One, depending on the receptor. Two, depending on where in the brain. Or the, or the or neuron. The, or the neuron or the nervous system that receptor sits. And so you can get things like euphoria and dysphoria and respiratory depression. But that would be more central though. That's right. Yep. But you also get an inhibition. Of pain. Of pain or nociceptive signals because it stops the pre- Synaptic neuron, so the first order order order. from sending the neurotransmitter. Across. And and also inhibits the second order neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, from receiving it. Right. And so... Which becomes important. You blunt that pain. Or you blunt the nociceptive signal. And that's really important. So this is what opioids do. And now you can go, oh, I know how opiates work. You know, the exogenous so, opioids. That so we're here, people. opioids, these are just things, chemicals that act on opioid receptors. That's right. But opio- opiates are coming specifically from a plant, like a, yes. p- a poppy. Yes. Which mim- mimic uh, opioid-like chemicals in our body, but they are created outside the body. Exogenously. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how they work. They, they simply modulate the conversation between the nociceptive neurons. And they don't just do it at the first and second order neuron. They do do it in the higher up, higher up as well. And that's hence the why you get those effects like euphoria, but also have an effect of – and I guess that with euphoria, that's going to then release other things like dopamine and so forth. Yep. And that's where it may become addictive. Is yep. that correct? Yep. But also then, like you said, a big uh, – consideration to have with uh, opioids is its effect on our control of breathing. Yes. And too many can depress the respiratory system, which is one of the ways that people who take too many opioids can do- And opioids could be anything from a milder form, let's say like codeine, morphine, heroin, yeah. even to fentanyl, let's say, which... Yeah. They, someone, sometimes their effect is just because they have a greater ability to cross the blood-brain barrier yeah. than each other. Therefore, if they can get into the brain at a rapid speed, at a higher concentration, they will have a more profound effect within That's the right. brain. Yeah, codeine, once it goes to the liver, which we call hepatic first pass, like 5% of it turns to morphine, right? And that's how it has its effect through opioid receptors. Right. Um, so, you know, it's that's basically how these drugs work now interestingly up in the brain itself the euphoria or dysphoria the opioids can produce don't necessarily inhibit the pain pathway like it does in the spinal cord distracts it it distracts it so if you ask someone who's experiencing pain and are taking opioids you still feeling the pain they go yeah i just don't care about it so it changes their perception of the pain but at the end of the day that's all pain is perception so they go yeah i know that there's something irritating annoying unpleasant here but i don't care 
right? Mm. So they're, they're the opioids. Now I want you to think, so that's, that's the descending inhibitory pathway, also known as the endogenous opioid system. But I also want you to think about, that's just serotonin. So think about noradrenaline. So noradrenaline is also released in this process. Is it the same family as serotonin? It is, yes. And it can inhibit pain as well. So one of the reasons why when you're on the footy field and you get smashed in the face, you get this huge uh, release of noradrenaline and that can inhibit your pain pathway. And, it and, that, and that would make sense because if you're in a, an acute situation where you have significant tissue injury, let's say you have a broken leg or something even worse, you your body has the capabilities of saying, hey, you don't feel pain at the moment, get out of this situation, yeah. get to safety, get to a hospital. And then once you feel reassured that you are in a safe place, then the sympathetic nervous system shuts off or shuts into the parasympathetic, which then on comes the pain. Yes. And so the way that the noradrenaline does this is that noradrenaline or norepinephrine, if you're in the US, binds to adrenergic receptors. And there's a whole bunch of different types. Alpha, beta, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2. Beta 2 receptors are located on the presynaptic terminals of neurons. These are the ones located on nociceptive fibres. So adrenaline will bind to alpha 2, inhibiting the release of um, substance P and glutamate. Right. That's how they work. Okay. But the other thing is that noradrenaline, when they bind to adrenergic receptors on motor neurons, stimulate them. So you get muscular contraction, you know, as a side effect of this. So uh, the example I like to give is that we're talking about a nociceptive pathway from everywhere below the head and neck, right? But if we talk about pain from the head and neck, it's going to be through the trigeminal nerve, right? Which would be, you know, some of the most common um, reasons to report pain would be tooth pain. Yes, yes. So, you know, basically any time you would choose to go to a dentist unless you get a clean is that you have tooth pain. Yes. So this is not insignificant. This is a very common problem that's going wrong with the public. Yeah. And have you ever noticed that when you're in pain you tend to clench your jaw? No. Really? Okay, so a lot of people when they're in a stressful environment or it's unpleasant – or maybe emotionally painful, they will clench their jaw. Oh, okay. Yeah. And one of the reasons... Oh, you mean... Okay, sorry. I thought you meant when you're in pain from your mouth. No, just, just in pain, pain generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. So, so like your grimace. Yeah. And yeah. One, one of the reasons why is because the noradrenaline that's released binds to the uh, neurons in the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve and stimulates them to shoot out to, and the jaw clenches. Right? right, so the right. jaw's the jaw's clenching as a result of the noradrenaline that's been that's in part noradrenaline that's been released. All right, so that's descending inhibition, but also want to talk about the fact that there's other drugs that we can take that inhibit some of these nociceptive stimuli. And because we spoke about damage to tissue, specifically damage to vascularized tissue, causing inflammation. So this is at the transduction level. Yeah, this is in the periphery. Yeah. Um, you've got those chemicals that are released from the cells. You know, the cells spilling their guts, releasing histamine, bradykinins and so forth. One of the big ones you said is prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are super important. Uh, they're created from the cell membranes of damaged cells. And so uh, how many cells have cell membranes? All of them. Okay, so yep. basically any cell have the capability of doing this? Prostaglandins are ubiquitous, meaning they're everywhere in the body and they play a huge amount of roles. They do heaps of stuff. Okay. Now, if you've got damaged tissue, prostaglandins are going to be released and prostaglandins tell blood vessels to dilate. So more blood can go to the area, more white blood cells, more cleanup, more, uh, you know, regeneration and healing. Great. Prostaglandins are important in inflammation. But the thing is prostaglandins can also trigger nociceptors. They can change the threshold to make it easier to send a painful or nociceptive stimulus, but also just directly stimulate nociceptors. So one way that you can mitigate pain is by getting rid of the prostaglandins or at least inhibiting them from being made. And the enzyme that makes the prostaglandins is called COX. Great name, huh? COX-1 and COX-2 make different types of What does it stand for? Uh, cyclooxygenase 1, cyclooxygenase okay. 2. So uh, generally speaking, because I said prostaglandins, and we probably should do a whole episode on, on this, but maybe we have. Prostaglandins... We have done NSAIDs. We have. Mm. Prostaglandins are everywhere in the body. They do heaps of stuff. 
you could broadly categorize them into two categories. One is prostaglandins that play a role in your mucosal membrane in your gut, so keeps your stomach protected from the acid inside. It helps your kidneys getting perfused, so it helps the blood vessel, urinal artery to main, maintain perfusion. perfusion, so it gets fed, so you can filter all the gunk that's in your blood. Gunk's a technical term. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, three, it inhibits platelets, right? Now, here's the other thing. Inhibits Fli- platelets aggregating. Aggregating, sorry, yes, platelet aggregation. These are all what we call constitutively activated functions of prostaglandins, meaning they're always turned on, the housekeeping functions. These are good. We want these happening at all times, right? Always on. That's mediated by COX-1 enzyme. The other prostaglandins, they play a role in inflammation, pain, fever, and activation of platelets. Activation of platelet aggregation. aggregation. Mm. All right. These are mediated by the COX-2 enzyme. So we want to create a drug, if you think about it, the COX-2 enzyme, it's the one involved in the pain, the fever, the inflammation, the stuff we want to stop. So we want a drug that can specifically inhibit COX-2 and really not inhibit COX-1. Because if you're inhibiting COX-1, you're going to – the integrity of your gut mucosa might be compromised, mm-hmm. so you might get ulcers. Your kidneys may not be perfused as well, so you might have some problem and get some kidney damage. And you might inhibit the inhibition of platelet aggregation, which means you might increase your ability to clot. Right. Right? Yep. Which for people with cardiovascular disease might be want. a risk. So we want to create a series of drugs that can just COX-2 specific. And these are where the NSAIDs come in, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But it must – it's pointed out that possibly the earlier types of NSAIDs didn't do that so well, so they're broader, right? Well, that's the whole point yeah. is that, you know, we So we're talking about like aspirin. Aspirin, ibuprofen, diclofenac, naproxen. They all inhibit COX-2, but they also all inhibit COX-1. Yeah. And depending on their dosage, to varying degrees. Aspirin probably more so inhibits COX-1 than COX-2. Right. So while it is an anti-inflammatory, an antipyretic and so forth – it does uh, alter the integrity of your gut mucosa, can put your kidneys at risk if you have too much, but also inhibits the inhibition of clotting. Which could be okay. Which can be great, which is why... Low-dose low aspirin is is good for that reason. That's the reason, yeah. right? So but it's probably the main reason why aspirin is taken now yeah. is because of its anti-clotting effect. But as time went on, we were able to identify some specific COX-2 inhibitors like coxibs, like salicoxibs. Purely because we were having such significant side effects being stomach ulcers and kidney failure. Yes. And so now we've got the coxibs, uh, one of which, or probably the only one in Australia, is salicoxib or salabrex, uh, and it will be is a COX-2 specific inhibitor. So it's great for inflammation. It's great for pain, great for fever. When we say inflammation, we probably in this case mean more chronic inflammation. So like uh, joint pain, osteoarthritis, things like that. Yep. Where you need to take it over longer periods. But one of the potential issues that they at least showed in the past but haven't with the current iteration of coxibs is that they, because they play that role in the cox2, which is inhibiting platelet aggregation, it can potentially theoretically lead to increased clotting. Right. So if you are at risk of some cardiovascular injury or issues, it can bring that at a higher risk. Because remember, the COX-2 enzyme created prostaglandins that inhibit platelet aggregation, right? So if you block that, you're inhibiting the inhibition of platelet aggregation so you lead to more clotting. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. So you're more likely to get stroke and certain um, you know, heart attack. Yeah. From the old, but they haven't shown that with the latest coccyps. Anyway, they all work by inhibiting the prostaglandins. That's the main point that I wanted to, to, to get across to you. Uh, right, so we've spoken about the difference between nociception and pain. What else do we need to talk about here? Well, maybe some um, – so I think we kind of touched on that there are, you know, we can classify pain as an acute versus chronic, which is obviously – determined by duration, right? So, And degree of sensitization. So if you were to have a painful experience after uh, tissue injury, yeah. once that tissue has been um, fixed and regenerated, then if that pain goes away, that would be what we consider a physiological 
response and it's kind of done what it's need to do. Mm. But if it remains, so you, if you continually to feel pain and so that would be now beyond, what is it, three weeks? Maybe, maybe longer slightly? Three months. Oh, months. Yeah. It would then be considered uh, chronic. Yes. And so this may be now becoming more problematic. And so this is one way of classifying pain. Is that right? Yeah, so as well. Just through du- duration? Chronic pain is um, designated just arbitrarily through a time period of three months. Okay. If you're still experiencing pain after three months, it's chronic pain. Now, you may be able to identify a cause and get rid of it and get rid of that chronic pain, or maybe the cause is non-identifiable and has resolved, but you're still experiencing pain due to the central sensitization that has occurred. Right, so that's one method of classifying pain. Another one you can look at maybe the agent that's leading to the pain. Yeah. So one of the most common causes or etiologies of pain is inflammatory base, based. Yeah. And I don't think we need to go through that. Basically, we sort of highlighted yeah. that, didn't we? But we can also have pain. So that's tissue driven, right? Yeah. But we can also have pain that is actually due to injury of the nerve itself. Yeah. So this would be termed neuropathic pain. Yeah. Now, when you say that, you're not saying, you know, a a pin has stimulated a nociceptor. You're saying that there's a lesion or actual trauma to a, an entire nerve. Yeah, or the central nervous system. So even the spinal cord or brain. Yeah. So if you cause multiple da- sclerosis, if you cause damage to that, that would also cause this neuropathic-like pain. Yeah. So if you were to compress a nerve, let's say a good example, this would be. Um, compressive neuropathies. So this is where you actually crush them in for some reason. An example would be um, carpal tunnel syndrome. So where that median nerve gets compressed within the carpal tunnel, that is going to cause a neuropathic type of pain. Yeah. And that becomes quite uh, – that probably then starts to move into a chronic form, right, where yes. it then becomes – difficult to treat and manage because you might go to a, a degree of sensitization which then is harder to get rid of. And you can damage you, you can get neuropathic pain not simply through direct trauma like compression or injury. Uh, f- you know again from trauma, you could get it from too much glucose in your bloodstream. Oh yeah, that's arguably one of the most common which is diabetic neuropathy, which yeah, that's right. So that causes damage to the nerve itself but by an accumulation of glucose-like products. And and um, we're not saying that, you know, you have a Coke and a donut and the high glucose is going to, in your bloodstream, in that transient moment, will damage your neurons. That's not the case. We're talking about diabetes. Years and the, years and years. Yeah, this is yeah. chronic elevation of blood glucose in unmanaged diabetic patients because they're not taking the insulin appropriately. Yeah. Right? Another example is an an infectious type of neuropathic pain and this could be you have uh, like shingles within a nerve and so this is a virus. Um, Usually you have it in childhood which is known as chickenpox but then it lays dormant um, within a a dorsal root ganglion which is the cell bodies of the sensory neurons and then for whatever reason usually it comes through periods of stress or your immune system has been dialed down it um, comes back out as an active virus and it's kind of known as a herpes type virus. And this is known as, I said shingles, right? Yep. And that then comes out through the sensory neurons and becomes highly painful. And one example of that or subtype of that is it can be in your trigeminal nerve, which is like a trigeminal neuralgia, which um, for the individual is a very painful experience and yes. sometimes – needs the drastic intervention like cutting the nerve yeah, because it's so painful. And it could be brought on by just non-painfully activating that neuron. So if you were um, – if your trigeminal nerve was um, infected by this particular virus, um, the part that innervates your mouth because the trigeminal has three parts to it, the part that goes to your mouth, just by swallowing, putting food in your mouth, you're stimulating that – the trigeminal nerve, yeah. and that's enough to bring on a neuralgic event. Yeah, cool. So we've got – so you first classified pain in accordance with its time period, so short-term acute, long-term chronic. You've spoken about nociceptive pain, which is simply stimulating the nociceptor, and you can do that through inflammation. 
You can do that through mechanical, thermal or chemical, which arguably inflammation sits within that category. You've got neuropathic pain, which is damage or a lesion directly to the neuron itself or of the neuron. You've got nociplastic. That's sometimes called nerve pain. Yep. Nerve pain, yeah. Yep. You've got nociplastic pain, which is newish, which is basically chronic pain or a type of chronic pain. It's the chronic pain where we actually don't know what the original cause is, right? So the original, there's, there's no observable tissue damage present, yet somebody's experiencing pain. Right. So that's the nociplastic pain. But you've also got referred and phantom pain. Right. Right? So what's, let's do referred pain first. So I think the definition of referred pain is basically uh, a painful experience that's felt, felt elsewhere in the body a, away from where the initiating nociception should be. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's, let's give the classic example of um, chest pain right. that's brought on from a heart attack. Okay, now the pain that – and this is an interesting point. I tried to weave this in earlier but I couldn't find the right po- point to bring it in. But um, the, the agent that brings on the painful experience is ischemic pain. Right. Okay, so what's happened with a heart attack is that blood flow to the heart muscle itself has been interrupted and all the cells that should be getting this blood isn't receiving blood anymore. And one of the most important things that blood should be bringing to the area is oxygen. Yeah. And so the tissue is now, particularly the muscles, are running out of oxygen. Now they try to make ATP without oxygen. And you can do that. This is called anaerobic respiration. But there's only a certain period of time you can do that for, right? Yeah, yeah. Until the cells will start dying. Now, in that early phase where you're potentially getting the chest pain, the metabolism of those cells start to alter and they're potentially producing certain metabolic byproducts. Like the hydrogen ions and the ATP and the lactate and the That's potassium. Right. And so that is going to sensitize the, the nerves within your heart muscle. Okay. And so how can we don't feel it as heart pain? Well, you do, but the difficulty is um, two things. Is firstly, your brain hasn't really ever, ever developed a good way of mapping your viscera like it has your body. Right. So it's never really gone. We oh. don't have a nice distinct internal map like of your heart. The external map. That's right. Because we don't use the heart to pick things up. That's right. That's right. right. That's exactly right. So it's never really formed an experience of what pain from the heart should be like. So it's just kind of like, oh, it's in this region. Yeah. But also the heart has come from, embryologically come from a certain part of your body where it's kind of migrated into. And the area that it first came from, and it's like myotomes and, and it's connective tissue and so forth. It's all the boring stuff. Brings, it brings the nerve with it. And so it's going to bring the nerves, the visceral nerves that are going to be approximately in the lower cervical, early thoracic regions. Neck and shoulders. Right. Right. And so where that visceral nerve, which is going to be taken, that sensory visceral experience from the heart is going to be taken back into the spinal cord but it's going back in more autonomic visceral nerves, Mm -hmm. but it's going to intermingle with the somatic nerves that are from skin and bones. It's jumping in, so it's basically all roads lead to Rome. So it's jumping into the spinal cord at the same level that sensory information from the shoulder, chest, correct, back, and so jump in. When it's jumping in with it, it can sometimes mix up with this other sensory somatic Mm -hmm. experience that you're having at the same time. And your brain interprets this as pain in radiating down your arm. So you don't actually have pain. jaw. So you don't actually have any tissue damage in the arm or jaw Correct. or chest. You've got tissue damage at the heart. Yep. But you're perceiving it in those areas. That's and right. And that's referred pain. Yep. Beautiful. But that brings on uh, an important point because when you have a patient presenting with a painful in, uh, experience, mm you would have an assessment tool. I won't really go through it, but they usually use a PQRST and that's all questions that you can ask to try to learn more information about. So that's not the ECG? No. Okay. So really quickly, P stands right. for provoking. What kind of brought on the pain? Okay. Um, Q is the quality of pain. How does it feel? What's the experience? R is radiating. Does it move or is it elsewhere in the body? 
Uh, S is the severity. That's kind of zero to 10. How bad is it? T is time. So when does it come on? When does it go away? Things like that. And then there's, they've added another one, which is you, the understanding. Right. The reason why I'm saying this is you might have a patient present with chest pain, okay, but that doesn't really tell you anything. It just means that the patient is feeling or having a painful experience in the chest region. But by asking certain ex- questions, you might be able to better understand why that pain is being uh, brought on. Sure. So if you're thinking if it's going to be arm – and usually when you have arm pain, that's going to be more musculoskeletal yeah. or skin. And so usually to provoke that pain, you just touch it. Yeah, true. Right? Yeah, true. So if you had a broken bone, how do you make the pain worse? Yeah, touch it. Touch it or move it. Yeah. Okay. But you can't touch or move the heart. Well, you know, okay. people have said I've touched their heart before. <laughs> so how do you get the heart to bring on more pain? Well, you – Exert, you do more things. Right. You increase the demand. activity of the body. Yeah. Because yeah. then the heart has to work harder. And then you're right. more likely to bring more ischemic pain. And so, usually, the pain experience of chest pain, if it is heart origin, yeah. it's on exertion. So, right. the patient presents by doing something. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. So, that's just giving an idea of the questioning around. You found the a way to, uh, to weave embryology into, yeah. into this uh, presentation. So I'm uh, f- simultaneously annoyed and impressed. Yeah. And finally. Wait, I want to talk about phantom oh, pain. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk about phantom pain. Is that what you were going to talk about? Yes, I was going to try to think of a segue, but. No, no, that's, let's that's just jump enough. into it. Okay, so phantom pain is generally when somebody experiences pain in an amputated limb. So let's just say an arm that is no longer present. And this is a really strange concept to say that, oh, my arm hurts, yet the arm no longer exists on my body. But I want you to think about this. You've had your arm amputated for whatever reason. Let's just say the elbow. Right arm no longer exists. But does the somatosensory map of your arm in the brain still exist? Yep. Yes. But is it receiving any information throughout the day? Not really, but I no. just wonder the where it was amputated, yep. there's still the cord of... Wait, no, okay. We'll get there, we'll get there. So that part of the brain is getting hungry because it's not receiving any information. So the one thing that you can always trust with the brain is that it wants constant input, particularly the somatosensory areas. One of the reasons why when you drift off to sleep... Have you ever just gone to that point where you're just drifting, then all of a sudden you throw out your arms and legs and you do that, and you wake yourself up? Because you've I'm not, I don't think arms. I think you do kicks. Right. Yeah. I've done arms. Punch my wife in the face accidentally. Well, sometimes you feel like you're falling, right? Yeah. But that, yeah. So anyway, just as you're drifting off, you th- jerk all your muscles out, right? And the reason why- That's why your wife doesn't sleep with you. <laughs> the, the reason why this happens is because you've had this whole day- of constant stimulus going to the somatosensory cortex because you've been walking, you're moving, you've got your pants on, you've, you're picking <laughs> objects up, like people are touching you, you're touching them. There's constant With sensory input. pants on or off? <laughs> <We're all> de- <laughs> it's to their own, right? But then you go to sleep and you're just laying there in bed. There's no sensory input, there's no stimuli. And the brain goes, what the hell's going on? Why aren't I getting any input? And so it goes, am I dying i need to just make sure that everything's okay it sends this big motor output you throw your limbs out you touch the objects around you you get sensory input oh it's okay i'm alive everything's all good go to sleep right sorry sorry i woke you up (laughs) that's all right um so the point i'm getting across here is the brain's hungry for input now you've got an amputated arm that part of the brain is not receiving that input so what it does is it amplifies any signal it possibly can coming from that area. What am I missing? What's going on? So amplify, amplify, amplify. At the same time, you've got this blunted nerves at the stump, damaged tissue, releasing chemicals. The neuron itself, because of the brain saying, hey, what's going on, is releasing chemicals, amplifying anything, any signal it might possibly receive from that area. And so what you end up getting is a phantom pain or a phantom – doesn't even have to be pain. It could be a phantom tickle. It could be a phantom stretch. It could be a phantom 
burn, right? It could be just simply that you perceive that the arm is twisted behind your back. Right. Right. Yep. It's just, it's not always a pain, but it can be. Okay. And so it's because of that, this whole amplification process going from the cerebral cortex coming back. And this is where I think it was R.S. Ramachandra. Mm, I think so. Um, With the mirror box. Mirror box. What he identified was that the visual cortex can override basically all other aspects of sensory input. And so he got a, a, a pretty much a shoebox, put a mirror in it, right in the middle of it, and put the person's arm in front of the box so it looked like they had two arms there. So the box was sitting there and they go, okay, look, you can see your arm that exists and you can see what looks like your arm that's gone, but it looks like it, it exists on the other or side. Or do they have a fake arm? No, well, th- there was with, that experiment. With a mirror. There and was they, that experiment. They, str- they stroked it while stroking the other arm. They also did that. Yeah. So they stroked that fake arm and the person knows it's fake. They know they've lost their arm, but because they, they're st- they are stroking the fake arm at the same time that they're stroking the real arm. They're going, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm yeah. feeling this. Yeah. And as soon as – but the other thing was as soon as the visual cortex saw the arm in the mirror and felt the experience, the pain went away. The tickling went away. The stretch, the, you know, the arm twisted behind the back totally disappeared. Yeah, okay. And so this is phantom pain. So – Again, Very interesting. it's so many different aspects. So we've spoken about the difference between nociception and pain as, a, as an experience. We've spoken about the pathway, the sensory pathway of nociception. We've spoken about the chemicals involved. We've spoken about the different types, descending inhibition. Um, what I did want to talk about, Matthew, was Brown-Saccard syndrome. No. <laughs> Why do you have to weave this into everything? All right. We won't, but the the thing I do want to say about this is I said to you that the nociceptive signal entered the spinal cord, synapsed with the second neuron and decussated immediately. So crossed to the other side of the spinal cord and ascends up to the brain on the opposing side of the spinal cord that it entered. So if I get pain of my left finger, it's traveling up to my brain on the right hand side of my spinal cord. Mm-hmm. This is different to touch. If you were to tickle my left finger, that touch signal goes up my spinal cord on the same same side side it enters. And what that tells you is that your simple fine touch proprioceptive pathway is ascending up to your brain on the opposite side that your pain or nociceptive and temperature pathway is. And this then simply allows clinicians a way to determine the level of spinal cord injury if somebody has hemiplegia or partial damage. Because you can say, well, if somebody has a damaged spinal cord on the right-hand side, right? Yeah, yep. You can tickle the finger. They'll they'll lose some sensation. They'll either be touch or either be pain. So they might lose temperature and pain, but but the intact is, um, you know, pleasant touch. Exactly, exactly. So that's called Brown-Saccard syndrome and and that is... Uh, a very important clinical correlate that you can utilize. All right, I'll leave it at that. I think we've done enough for nociception and pain. We need to go to listener mail. Uh, Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.